Secondly, to keep from having to postpone or delay projects, we approached our vendors who agreed to defer a large portion of their costs to be paid out of production. This is a highly unusual win-win because they accepted reservoir risk and corporate identity risk in return for keeping their employees working. So they had to be very certain of ATP and the quality of its reservoirs. Third, we worked with the government of China to finance continuing construction instead of slowing the construction down as the operator, as we the operator, had a right to do. The Chinese used their stimulus money to actually pay workers to work. And thus China deferred some of our costs to future years, and we continue to stay on schedule. Each time I visit with a potential ATP investor, there is a question which arises, and it takes different forms. You only take on projects <coughs> drilled by others who find hydrocarbons but don't develop them? So you're going to run out of projects or they will be so small they'll be meaningless? Neither has happened in the 19 years since I founded ATP. The inventory of projects with proved reserves is substantial. Five years ago, I created an innovative incentive for my employees to focus on delivering proved reserve acquisitions, the incentive. If ATP exceeded its annual reserve replacement target of 200% and completed several other ambitious projects and production goals, I volunteered that ATP would buy each employee, and we had approximately 50 employees at the time, a brand new Volvo S60. During that year, the 200% target was exceeded with a reserve replacement ratio of 1,367%. <laughs> Employees were able to select their own vehicle, and as part of the overseas delivery program, employees and their spouses were flown to Sweden to pick up their vehicle at the plant. As a young man, I saw my father rarely appreciated by his employer for his hard work. Part of my leadership principle is to appreciate, value, and reward employee contributions and thus create loyalty. We have an outstanding retention of employees and we still have a parking lot of bottles. <laughs> commodity price drop in history in 2008 from $147 a barrel to $33. And the downturn in natural gas from $13 to $4.50 per MMBTU. While many decisions were made at higher price decks, ATP is so risk averse and prudent that we covered all obligations and never missed a beat. A current challenge I face is the government reaction to the BP oil spill. All of us recoiled from that image of the uncontrolled plume of oil spewing forth hour after hour on every TV set and every website for over 80 days. Rather than focusing on swiftly addressing the well, the administration, with a knee-jerk reaction, imposed a moratorium on all deep water companies, punishing companies like ATP, which have always drilled safely and environmentally soundly.
the impact to ATP was immediate. The impact to you as a consumer is yet to be felt. Petroleum is a product vital to the economy. And it is in your everyday life, not just when you drive your car. There are a great number of life-saving drugs and medicines, aspirin, and the histamines, antibiotics, and the list is very long derived from hydrocarbons. Additionally, construction materials, consumer products like furniture, umbrellas, and shoes, and even the clothes you wear, all come from hydrocarbon natural resources. Scarce supply will impact our quality of life. Since Kerr McGee first drilled offshore Louisiana in 18 feet of water depth, our domestic industry has drilled 58,375 wells to find and develop oil and gas resources in the Gulf of Mexico without ever having Rather than emphasize that this has never happened before in 60 years of drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, the media and the administration panicked. Rather than applauding the innovation that has occurred to enable us to extract this vital resource from deep water depths, the media chose to make this a negative. The moratorium has been lifted. But what continues is an ad hoc moratorium by the government's regulatory body failing to issue permits for the industry to again begin activities. Although we at ATP never saw the supposedly cozy relationship we were to have enjoyed with the Minerals Management Service, we continue to be responsive to the many changes we are experiencing from this administration as we continue to pursue the business plan we've had in place for almost 20 years through both Republican and Democratic administrations. I believe in the vital importance of finding and delivering needed energy supplies to our country. I am proud to share with you that over the last five years, ATP has reinvested 100% of our cash flow in further development of oil and gas. That's a gigantic statement about how positive we feel about what we do. And incidentally, ATP's business is spread across 44 of our 50 states. When ATP is shut down, Companies in 44 states experience a loss of revenue. We have explored challenges of developing natural resources and various approaches I employed to address them. My family values were formative in my approach to business. I grew up in the rural area outside Fort Wayne, Indiana in a two-story home built from the ground up by my father, who struggled to complete the house construction while he worked full time. We did not have indoor plumbing until I was in high school. The water we used for bathing and cooking, we carried into the house in buckets from an outside pump. Obviously, when we had need, we could only utilize an outdoor facility. All of this served to make my family appreciate indoor plumbing even more when we had all the, had all the pipes connected to the house. <laughs> Only one room, the dining room downstairs, was heated. In the cold winters, we were a pretty cohesive family of seven as we conducted our activities. Our economic circumstances were partly dictated by my father's limited education, but he was brilliantly gifted 
He taught himself how to play the violin, for example. And together, my dad and mother believed education for all of their children was essential. The challenge of overcoming my family's economic circumstance was aided by our goats. We sold goat's milk to lactose intolerant people who could not drink milk from cows. And it was my responsibility to take care of the goats from the time I could barely carry a bucket. So assuming responsibility at an early age, competing with my brainy sisters to excel in the classroom, punctuated by the emphasis on education by my parents, propelled me to accept a scholarship from Valparais University. Our family sharecropped the garden at our neighbor's farm where they had draft horses instead of a tractor. Our garden was placed into the paddock the horses had occupied the previous year, so it was well fertilized. <laughs> when I was finished with my chores of hoeing and planting, weeding or harvesting, I climbed the fence and joined the massive Percherons and Belgian draft horses, which were gentle giants, and imagined I was riding a native dancer in the Belmont for <laughs> citation in the Derby. And that led to the challenge of constructing a farm or training racehorses before I ever owned a horse. Elvis Presley had a hit single, Follow That Dream. Creating Goldmark Farm, a palace for thoroughbreds, has been a lifelong dream. The business plan is not complicated. Offer sterling, state-of-the-art facilities where horses actually sleep on mattresses. Never take a bad step on rough ground until they're older and their fragile legs have developed some toughness and to attract enough outside clients with horses to train to pay for my Goldmark horses. After three short years in operation, Goldmark fielded a horse named Backtalk. They're on the track for the ninth race. This is the 95th running of the Sanford Stakes for two-year-olds. Quarter-inch bench shoes for numbers two, three, and seven. And here's the field. Number one is Sound Man, owned by West Rock Stables, trained by Wayne Lucas, written by Cornelia Velasquez. 1A is Activity Report, owned by West Rock Stables, trained by Wayne Lucas, written by Jamie Theria. Number two, Enumerate, on by Pato Stables, trained by Steve Aspison with Edgar Prado. Number three is Louisville Luminary, on by Ackley Brothers Farm, trained by Steve Aspison with Julian Leperoux. And number four is Back Talk, on by Goldmark Farms, trained by Tom Amos with Miguel Mena. Number five, Not Your Friend, on by George and Lori Hall, trained by Kelly Green with Joe Bravo. Number six, Brick Player. Owned by the Dogwood Stable, trained by Frank Alexander with Javier Castellano. Number seven, Bulls and Bears, owned by Claridge Stables. And William H. Lawrence, trained by Rick Violet with Alan Garcia. And number eight is Interactif. Owned by Wertheimer and Brother, trained by Todd Pletcher, and written by John Velasquez. That's the field. The horses have reached the starting gate, they're at the post. <laughs>